I'm going to start by asking, has anybody heard of an institution called the Tiger Temple? Yeah, okay, that's good. I love preaching the converted. Everybody else, um, just to fill you in. Um, so this is the website of the Tiger Temple. It's uh, in Northern Thailand. It's an institution that keeps tigers. Um, you can probably see on this website in the top right hand corner there, it's uh, got the Traveler's Choice Award 2015 from TripAdvisor. And uh, it claims to be, ooh, where are we? Uh, have been founded in 1994 as a forest monastery and a sanctuary for numerous wild animals. In 1995, it received the Golden Jubilee Buddha, made of 80 kilograms in gold. 1999, it received its first tiger cub, which had been found by the villagers and died soon after. Several tiger cubs were later given to the temple, typically when the mothers had been killed by poachers, and eventually the numbers came up to almost 90. The hands-on approach of the monks led to happy tigers and a successful breeding program which they suspect are a sort of Indo-Chinese sort of rare subspecies of tiger. Um, and they say, again on the website, the temple sees between 300 and 600 visitors every day. The entry fee goes to feeding the animals, keep building funds to create a large tiger sanctuary, which will allow the animals to live in an almost natural environment. And they're hoping to buy a large amount of land, set up a Buddhist park, to release the tigers into the wild in the future. There are donation boxes and all the donations from the tourists go to the sanctuary. So this is what's on their website. And again, you call your attention to the fact that, you know, they, they look brilliant. And if you're coming at this from the point of view of a tourist on holiday in Northern Thailand, you'd be absolutely forgiven of, for thinking these guys are nice people who are doing absolutely everything right. And you would have been very, very wrong indeed. Um, last year, the Tiger Temple was raided and closed by the Thai authorities. 137 tigers were removed. They discovered 40 carcasses of tiger cubs in the freezer. Uh, a monk and two other men were apprehended leaving the temple in a lorry containing two full-length uh, tiger skins, about 700 amulets made from tiger parts and a load of tiger fangs. And then subsequently, Thai police found what was thought to be a slaughterhouse and a tiger holding facility um, used for trafficking animals across the borders and through supplying restaurants that specialize in giving tiger meat to tourists. And probably most of the tiger bones ended up in uh, China where they'd be used for traditional Chinese medicine uh, to create um, lion bone, tiger bone wine, that sort of thing. So that's an example of what you're up against as a tourist. If you want to go somewhere and you want to support something that's doing a good job, you may well end up supporting something that's doing the exact opposite. It's very easy for some institutions to sound like they're exactly what you're looking for. So against this background, um, let's have a look at the sort of standards of wildlife tourism across the, across the board. So what we're talking about is tourism specifically based on encounters with non-domestic animals. Um, we don't know how big the market is at all, but it's somewhere between 20 to 40 percent of all tourism, all international tourism, um, revolves around people at some point in the holiday going and having an interaction of some description with wild animals. So it's really the principal source of revenue for lots and lots of people across the globe. It's an absolutely huge market. Now, the benefits of this type of tourism are that it provides um, some way of valuing wildlife. So lots of conservation problems, for example, um, stem from local people who don't have a lot of money not being able to value their natural resources against a whole bunch of alternative land uses. Now, if tourists come in and are willing to pay to see the wildlife, then you get livelihoods for the local population, you get protection of those areas. So those are benefits. But there is always going to be some sort of trade-off between conservation of animals, the welfare of those animals, the satisfaction of the people going to these locations, and profitability. So when I started looking at this area, it's sort of late 2014, there was literally nobody who could tell you how many types of wildlife tourism there are out there and what their impacts were, which seemed to be something of an omission. So, 
we, were, we set out to sort of solve this problem and see what was going on. We're not talking about consumptive activities. We're not talking about hunting. We're not talking about fishing. Because generally, if a tourist goes on holiday on safari with the idea that they're going to shoot a lion, they have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen to that lion as a result of their holiday. Um, we're interested in the people who go and to somewhere like the Tiger Temple, get into a cage with a tiger for whatever reason. Um, if they think that's a good idea, fine. Um, but then the tiger obviously survives this interaction. But what's the effect on the tiger? What's the effect on the tiger species? Um, so we're talking only about non-consumptive tourism. And we're not talking about zoos, because zoos have an entire set of standards. And they tend to have multiple animals. So people go to a zoo to sort of browse the animals, whereas a lot of wildlife tourism is, I want to go swimming with dolphins. I want to see a tiger. I want to bottle feed lion cubs. You're basically having a direct interaction with one type of animal. And there are huge numbers of unregulated activities where you can do just that. So we did a uh, desk study. And we just had a look to see what was out there. We found 48 different types of activity you could get involved with, with sort of single species of animals out there. We only had time to really look at the impacts of half of these, 24. And what we've got are sort of categories. The top category here, I don't know how legible this is, and I apologize for the font size, is captive interactions. So things like bear parks that you can go to in Japan where there are bears in large concrete pits and they kind of do a dance and you can feed them from a balcony. Or dolphin interactions, you'll see these advertised the world over where you want to kick, tick something off your bucket list, you want to swim with a dolphin, so you get in the swimming pool for 10 minutes and then you come out. Elephant parks, treks, tiger interactions we've talked about, lion encounters are a sort of South African phenomenon where you can bottle feed cubs. Then we've got um, sanctuaries, which are similar to captive um, interactions. The main difference is that what sanctuaries are doing is they're deliberately taking animals from one set of circumstances into captivity in order to raise the standard of welfare for those animals or to give money to a local conservation initiative. And these tend to be the but largely the only way you can differentiate these from an external point of view is that sanctuaries largely do not allow you to interact with the animals. You don't go to a sanctuary expecting to cuddle an orangutan, which is a good thing because an orangutan could unscrew your head and it's not good for the orangutan. Um, then there's farmed wildlife attractions. Now these are distinct from the others in that the main source of income from the people doing the farming is the farming itself, it's the product. But they also open their doors to tourists. So the top one there is civet coffee, which used to be uh, you'd have civets wandering around in the jungle eating coffee cherries and somebody would find a pile of digested coffee cherries and bizarrely thought it would be a good idea to dry that out, grind it, run water through it and drink the result and then sell it for a vast amount of money. Um, again, I have no idea why, but because of the vast amount of money aspect, there are now cage after cage after cage of captive civets that are largely caught from the wild and that are being force fed a diet of coffee cherries for multiple years until they're turfed out and usually die of malnutrition. Um, but there are things like crocodile farms which, though sort of slightly dodgy on the welfare side of things, do definitely have some sort of conservation um, uh, benefit in so far as they take the pressure off wild crocodiles. There's no need to hunt them. Street performances are sort of what people classically think of. These have been going on for hundreds of, if not thousands of years. Got people dressing monkeys up to attract tourists. Uh, hyena men in Nigeria who kind of dance with hyenas again to attract money and <laughs> probably to go away. In the, in the, nobody really wants a hyena that close. And then you have wild interactions. So these are where the animals are still in the wild and tourists trek to see the animals. Now, that doesn't mean there are no impact on the animals, but um, that's something we needed to look at. So, um, taking the first ones first, um, with the captive interactions, we're talking probably millions of visitors for hundreds of thousands of animals, um, things like that. With uh, sanctuaries, 
we're talking again probably half a million million visitors a year something like that tens of thousands of animals involved in sanctuaries um, farmed wildlife not so many visitors, well, you know, one and a half million, something along those lines. Again, hundreds of thousands of animals involved. And again, street performance tends to be fewer visitors, fewer animals. And again, trekking, hundreds of thousands of animals, hundreds of thousands of visitors. These are not small numbers. So the question is, what are the likely conservation and welfare impacts? Now, I don't propose to go through these uh, flowcharts in any detail. This is just to show that we did our homework and that we thought it through. But what we largely had to do is very coarsely, on a minus three to plus three scale, work out whether these things were good for conservation. And that's largely based on whether they took animals from the wild and what the species status of those animals were and where, if there are any compensations for doing so. Likewise, with animal welfare, it a lot depends on the intention of the um, attraction and the standards that they're kept. Again, we, we listed them from a minus three to a plus three. It's really coarse, it's really dirty, there are things we'll have got wrong, but we had to start somewhere. It's a massive industry no one had looked at. So, this, um, I'm gonna jump off the stage here. So, what we've got is conservation going from minus three to plus three, and um, animal welfare from minus three to plus three. So everything up here is pretty good, everything down there is pretty bad. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Thank oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> so these things in the top right are generally the things that are doing it right. So these tend to be the sanctuaries, they're set up um, to sort of take animals from uh, one set of circumstances and put them in another. And uh, gibbon watching here has very good conservation impact and zero impact on the actual gibbons. So these tend to be things like walking through a forest where you pay to go for a guided tour and that money secures the habitat. So that's those guys. These guys down here are the ones that are probably good for conservation or we gave them the benefit of the doubt. There are a few in there that I probably wouldn't give the benefit of the doubt to now. But because we had to be impartial and because we had to do it you know, based on our best guess from the literature and what we had, um, we really had to give things the benefit of the doubt. So these are the things that have a positive conservation impact but probably aren't good for the animals. Now there are a couple of interesting cases in here. The one on the far right, the GT, that's trekking to see gorillas. Now we definitely know that this is a welfare problem for gorillas. Um, you know, they're stressed out by interactions with tourists. They can catch diseases from tourists. But on the flip side, if that um, form of interaction didn't happen, it's likely their habitat would have gone by now because the revenue from tourism is what's protecting it. So there are definitely sort of trade, trades off to be had there. So that's these guys. And then everything else is pretty much bad. Um, so take home messages from these 24 types that we looked at, and this is half of the 48 we found. Um, we're talking about negatively impacting the welfare status of about 230,000 to half a million individual animals. And about 120 to 340,000 animals were employed in attractions that negatively impacted their conservation status. And only about 1,500 to 13,000 animals were in attractions that had positive animal welfare and positive conservation impacts. And that means that of the 3.6 to 6 million tourists visiting these attractions every year, about two to four million are participating in activities with neg negative animal welfare and or conservation impacts. And they probably don't want to be. We, in fact, my recent research has basically shown that tourists really, really want to have positive impacts, but they're not. So, why? Um, given these impacts, what do the participating tourists think? Well, thankfully, oops, wrong way. Thankfully, we can find out because they tell us what they think on things like TripAdvisor. Um, so, what we did is very quick and dirty again. We assumed that anyone who gave a excellent or very good review on TripAdvisor was really wanting to promote the attraction. Anybody who gave a poor or terrible review didn't like it very much. Uh, now that could be because someone was rude to them or they didn't like the coffee, so I had to spend months of my life 
going through the uh, negative reviews on TripAdvisor for all these things to differentiate the ones that didn't like the coffee from the ones that didn't like the animal welfare standards. And believe me, that's depressing. Um, so if you ha put in what a um, negative percentage of negative reviews, um, none of them really gets above 20%. So that means that even for some of the very worst attractions out here, 80% of the tourists gave a positive review. Um, for example, for the Tiger Temple, which I described at the beginning, 78% of the people who went there said, this was great, that was really good, I'm glad I went. They just don't understand. The tourists aren't really able to see what's going on. Um, there were a few very minor cases where obviously the standards were so poor that people were up in arms about it, but generally speaking, tourists are extremely poor at, um, at gauging these things. So this is just a graph showing exactly what I was talking about. And actually, the largest range of um, dissatisfaction for any of these was for crocodile farms. Um, so the tiger interactions people tended to like, and in fact, um, one of the people I despise most on the planet was a guy who gave a three-star review saying, I had a lovely time, I couldn't help feeling a bit sorry for the animals, which really sort of suggests to me that there's something going on in people's brains. If they come, kind of go to an attraction and they see the standards aren't that good, but that means they haven't been a good person, what we tend to do in those situations is we tend to minimize that to ourselves and kind of change our perception of who we should be. And so... I think the tourist reviews are a really, really unreliable way of, for people to find out what the standards are at attractions, because tourists, yeah, for a start, they're not animal welfare specialists. I've been, I went on an elephant ride when I didn't know any better, and I'm kind of ashamed of having done that. And I think that most people, if they're ashamed of having done something along those lines, would just not add, you know, admit to it and leave a fairly positive review. So, given that tourist reviews are not going to be sufficient to regulate the, the uh, industry, we're left with having to try and create guidelines. And I think to round this off, at the moment, we're not in a position where we can really say anything very concrete. But generally speaking, if you're in a position to cuddle, touch, otherwise ride or otherwise interact with an animal, then by and large, you are probably stuffing up along the lines. That's not concrete. There are obviously going to be attractions that do allow these things to have excellent standards, and there are going to be places that don't allow these things to have poor standards. But that's pretty much as close as we can get to a guideline at the moment in the absence of any regulation whatsoever or any kind of universally acknowledged certification scheme. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's, um, it's great to see you all here at the end of what I know is a, is a busy, long day. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, following Tom, I, I'm quite depressed now, so... Uh, um, yeah, uh, my name's Nick Stewart, and I, I lead and coordinate uh, Wild Animal Protection's global approach to tackling the issue of um, wildlife that's been captured or bred in captivity um, for use as entertainment in the tourism industry. And um, I'm actually really glad to be here today discussing this particular question, um, can wild animal interactions ever be responsible, um, rather than say something along the lines of, is the industry doing enough? Because I think it enables us, following Tom, to peel back to what we know is good and bad for animals and, and go with the evidence. So Wildlife for Night Entertainers has been a dedicated campaign since uh, 2015, but it's, it builds on a number of years of investigations and campaigning um, and research. And we define wildlife entertainment as using captive wild animals, uh, primarily for entertaining people, in ways that cause harm, stress, or discomfort to them. Um, and I want to draw your attention to those last three, that, that last point really, because I think to best answer this uh, session's question, it turns on answering another simple que simpler question, really, a more fundamental question. Do wild animal interactions cause harm? Do they cause stress? Uh, and do they cause discomfort? So, um, you know, wildlife tourism, is, as Tom says, uh, you know, it's a huge market. It undoubtedly has positive impacts on livelihoods and on conservation, but it does have trade-offs on both conservation and uh, animal welfare. And those trade-offs start with uh, wildlife being either uh, taken from their natural habitat or bred in captivity, 
Um, and in both cases, often removed from the mothers at uh, a young age. That follows with being kept in uh, inadequate conditions, uh, conditions that cause suffering because they're unable to meet their physiological or psychological or social needs. They, um, many of them will experience pain as part of the intensive training methods uh, they have to go through uh, to make them perform or interact, to make them submissive enough and compliant enough to um, interact with visitors um, as part of the entertainment. So as Tom has already pointed out, in 2015, the research that Oxford released of those 24 wildlife tourism attraction types, 18 of them, involving up to 550,000 animals, which I find quite staggering, um, have negative welfare impacts. And only six of them had positive impacts. None of them involved direct interactions with animals. And Tom's research really led to our checking out our cruelty report in 2016, in which we highlighted um, the top 10 cruelest attraction types involving things like elephant rides or walking with lions or interacting with tigers. So many of you um, in the industry uh, will be familiar with our work um, on elephants, which we've done a lot of. Um, earlier this year we released our report after spending two years in the field looking at 3,000 elephants in captivity in tourism in Asia, uh, including all of them in Thailand. Now, 77% of them, or three out of four of them, are living in poor and unacceptable conditions. And all of these are at venues that offer elephant rides. And when the elephants are not being ridden, they, um, they're chained often day and night, often on chains less than three meters long. Um, they've got limited appropriate veterinary care. Uh, they have any inadequate diets, and they're kept in um, stressful situations. And that kind of uh, husbandry and living conditions follows the trauma in early years of separation from the mothers. Um, and then uh, what was undoubtedly a harsh uh, training process to make them submissive and compliant enough to interact with tourists and, and give rides um, and shows. And, and it's worth noting that in Tom's research, elephant rides, uh, as, as uh, if, you, if you saw in his presentation, scored both negatively on both the welfare and the conservation impacts. We've recently undertaken um, a study on the impact of the growing wildlife selfie craze um, on animals in the Amazon rainforest. And it was the world's first complete review of wildlife tourist attra tourism attractions in Latin, Amer Latin America where uh, tourists can interact directly with wildlife. 54% of the 249 attractions that we uh, found online offered direct interaction. 94% of the excursions offered by the tour operators we uh, investigated in Manaus, uh, the gateway city in Brazil, gave the opportunity to touch and hold wild animals as props. Um, and you can't quite see that last point, but there's been an absolutely staggering increase of the number of wildlife selfies on Instagram since 2014, increased by 292%. And of course the issue is um, that it's very difficult for a tourist to know. The, the cruelty and the issues are hidden, so this is what a tourist will see in their 10 minute experience, their once in a lifetime opportunity. And this is what you don't see. You know, this is an animal, a sloth in the Amazon, uh, minding its own business in its natural habitat, a casualty of illegal logging, um, removed from the world and then sold not that long after uh, in the local market for £9.80, um, to then uh, carry on its life uh, as a tourist entertainer. And we know that most of these sloths, um, they're quite iconic, so that's why we focused on them they uh, tend to live for only six months after capture. And in our observations, when we're looking at their needs and their welfare, sloths tend to sleep for 15 to 18 hours a day. Sounds like a great life to me. But in these, um, in these kind of situations, they sleep for just 2% of the time, which undoubtedly has an impact on their, their welfare. So this is just a snapshot. Um, but as you can see, it paints a fairly depressing picture. Um, and I bet you're wishing we'd gone to the bar now instead of coming into this. Um, and it's very difficult for us uh, to reconcile these types of tourist interactions with animal welfare and conservation concerns. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's some great leadership actually being shown by the industry to start to tackle these, these issues. Um, in 2016, TripAdvisor stopped selling tickets to wildlife attractions, allowing direct interaction with tourists, and we continue to um, engage them about their position and their policy. That's the new Germany's Travel Association DRV in the Netherlands and NVR published uh, industry leading guidance for their members, um, including recommending against direct contact with elephants. This year, uh, Dare Touristic uh, committed across its uh, brands to having no wild animal interactions by uh, 2020. Um, 
With 185 progressive travel companies now signed up to uh, help elephants, that means they've committed to uh, ceasing the sale of rides or shows. Um, and importantly, this year we've seen the first fall in China, uh, including uh, Kaiser Tourism, which is one of the top 10 travel companies in China. And that's a really important step because um, of the scale and the growth of the Chinese markets to places like Southeast Asia. And to put it in context, of the 30 million visitors that head to Thailand each year, 10 million of them are from China. And it wasn't an easy decision for a company like Kaiser to make. 40% um, of their revenue in Southeast Asia comes from elephant rides. So it was a difficult decision, but it was one that they made because it was the right decision. And it was great to see Thomas Cook dropping animal excursions this year. Um, and TripAdvisor, again, you can't see it on this slide, but we had really positive discussions with them. They've committed to interrupting hashtag searches, where people are searching for things like um, hashtag wildlife selfie or hashtag elephant rides with a pop-up. Um, to warn people of the issues, give some education and link back to our website, which we think is a fantastic step. So they're the problems. Uh, what, is, what is responsible then? Again, this is a short session, so I'm just going to give you some very high-level principles, which um, aligns with what Tom was saying. Because wild animals have complex physiological, psychological, behavioural needs, you know, it's very hard to, to uh, reconcile interactions with uh, meeting those needs and tourist interactions. So our position is really see them in the world with a responsible tour operator or at a genuine sanctuary or a wildlife friendly attraction that puts the needs of the animals first because unfortunately there is a proliferation of sanctuaries brand, or, or of attractions branding themselves as sanctuaries and rescue centers i think just a couple of um, guidance points on this a, res uh, a sanctuary is um, is an attraction that rescues animals from worse conditions, takes them from other captive institutions, rehabilitates them and returns them to the wild where possible. And in most cases, they will offer an observation and an experience. And avoiding these where the animal can't choose to engage in a behavior, um, if it's forced, if it's baited, or if it's restrained. And then just bring it back to Tom, uh, Tom's research and Oxford's research. Only six of the 24 wildlife tourism attraction types had positive scores, and five of those were sanctuaries, which is telling. And none of them had direct interactions. In our elephants' work, um, that I mentioned earlier, only 7% of those elephants uh, we found in Asia were living at high welfare venues. Uh, that's 194 out of almost 3,000. At these venues, there were no rides and there were no performances direct interaction was prohibited or limited. So what they were offering was observation only experiences, just allowing tourists to see elephants being elephants. The Proving Demand Working Group is a group that uh, World Animal Protection facilitates and chairs and has membership of um, travel industry leadership. And what we're doing is generating the demand from the industry as well as creating the solutions on the ground those wildlife tourism attractions that put the needs of elephants first, but off, uh, also offer an alternative, authentic wildlife experience. Um, we had a very successful meeting in Bangkok a couple of months ago. We invited uh, elephant camps uh, to the meeting. We presented the business case to them. And um, we've had a lot of expression of interest from elephant camps in Thailand who are willing to transition their business model to a high welfare model, an observation only model. Um, We'll be in a position to make an announcement on that soon, and late next year we should have uh, the first of those camps transitioned. Um, and as well as providing technical advice on elephant management to those camps, we're also, we're also providing um, business planning and financial um, planning assistance to ensure the viability of those camps. But you know, their viability also turns on footfall and the, there is a need for the travel industry and those progressive companies who've already cut out the worst attractions, rides and shows from their itineraries, we need them to connect, we need you to connect with these camps um, to ensure their viability. So just some final thoughts to leave you with, I'm probably running out of time now. The impacts are well documented, we know that for Oxford's research, of course there are grey areas and there's more to do, um, but from our research and others. The range of those impacts do make it difficult to reconcile wildlife interactions with the animal welfare and conservation trade-offs that you've heard about. Tourists can't tell. I mean, we know that they are motivated primarily by uh, a love of animals, and it's very difficult for them to see what's good and what's bad. So continued leadership, including choice editing, is needed from the industry, um, alongside, obviously, continued education of tourists. Genuine wildlife friendly attractions and sanctuaries offer a humane, authentic wildlife experience, and in most cases these will be observation only. 
And it's more than just husbandry considerations only. Like this is more than just ensuring that they have enough water or making the trains a bit longer. You know, this is fundamentally about whether or not wildlife, because of their complex physiological, environmental, psychological needs, and because we know relatively little about those, this is about whether or not those needs can ever be met in the kinds of situations that you've heard from us today. Um, so really the message is to protect them and see them in the wild, or as close to the wild um, and their natural habitat as possible. Having said that, you know, all tourism can be more responsible, and we recognise that, and we know that not all animals can be in sanctuary type conditions, although that's the goal. So any improvements that the industry can make is laudable. Um, but the, the main term solution to that still has to be a visionary goal of shifting away from these types of interactions and these type of experiences to more responsible alternatives that put the needs of animals first. Thank you. As I said, I'm not going to go further into the detail that the other speakers have, have covered. What I want to explain is how we've started to manage these issues and these challenges. Um, as you can imagine, um, with over 22,000 people, um, taking 19 million people on holiday every year, it's all over the world, um, to many different types of holiday. It's difficult to understand where to start, where to begin to understand what our impacts are on animals in tourism. What we do have um, is an articulated sustainability strategy. We're looking at across all of our impacts in each area of our operations. Animal welfare is a huge part of that. To start looking at what our risks were, um, and particularly for me, starting looking at animals in tourism two years ago, um, I was somewhat amazed to see that um, in the UK we had an accepted set of industry standards um, that were run and operated uh, by ABTA, which um, were broadly accepted by the industry, but no one was doing anything about in terms of understanding whether attractions were compliant with those industry standards. In 2016, um, we commissioned uh, an animal welfare audit program um, against industry standards as set out by ABTA um, from Global Spirit, um, who are uh, an external animal welfare and tourism specialists. We were frankly amazed by the results. Um, we we didn't understand uh, the levels of poor care for animals that were involved in our supply chain. The examples of non-compliance against the standards, um, which are criticised in some quarters, um, but it's very clear that um, issues were very plain to see across what we audited. Um, things like appropriate food provision, rest time, provision of shade, all seem like quite straightforward things to be able to offer to animals in tourism, um, but they were uh, a lot of what we audited fell well short of those standards. Um, there were no particular, um, no particular types of issues were identified. There were no themes. Um, some attractions refused to give us any element of cooperation at all. Um, they didn't want to let us in. They didn't want to help us understand what our impacts were as a business. In the face of that, um, our smiley CEO, Peter, um, articulated earlier this year that he was disappointed um, um, and set out our new policy. Um, we've committed that um, nothing we sell that doesn't meet the ABTA Global Welfare and Guidance, um, we won't sell it. Um, so as far as we understand, we're the first business to audit externally against this standard. Um, we're the first to take out um, what was 16 attractions out of 25 last year, um, which we found were not compliant and refused to move towards compliance on a journey with us. Um, since our announcement, um, which was broadly well received earlier in the year, um, as Nick set out, we've seen huge movements from, from the industry um, and I think we can um, certainly say that there has been a lot of progress in the last 12 months, but um, ahead of that, um, it was, there was not a lot of progress being made. And there still continues to be mainstream UK and European tour operators and travel industry businesses that um, 
take no effort to ram their commitment to animals in their supply chain. So our, our approach is pretty straightforward. Um, we expect all animals to comply with external audits. Um, we expect all excursions, all suppliers to do that. Um, if the attraction doesn't let us in, we take them off sale. Um, if Once they've been audited, um, if we understand there are actions and issues from that audit, they have three months to fix those outstanding actions. If they can't fix it, we take it off sale. Um, so as I said, we were, um, I think our announcement, which was covered quite widely um, in the UK press, was, was well received and uh, it demonstrates to us that um, there's so much more we need to do. Um, there is huge demand from consumers and customers for us to take action on animals in our supply chain. Um, and I think our results continue to show that we need to do a lot more. There are very straightforward issues that arise in our audits in all sorts of animal attractions. And I think there's something to take away from whatever type of attraction that you're talking about that can be very present and real issues in that. So I wanted to talk quickly about what our key priorities were for next year. Um, we plan to have all of our excursions that we offer directly audited by the end of next year, so we will be able to give a clear picture to our customers um, what meets the standards that we have set out. Um, that is by no means the end of our policy, though. That is a first step. We realise that there's a lot more to do. We realise that the issues um, are pervasive within the supply chain. Um, we're determined to work with other operators. Um, we want to see a lot more from the rest of the industry on these issues. Um, we're working with other partners and ABTA to, to develop a shared auditing programme to make sure that all of those non-compliant attractions, whatever they are, are, are taken off sale and removed uh, and customers aren't given access to them. Um, we want to make sure to working with uh, partners that no operators can continue to sell attractions that are, are so poor. Um, we, you know, we want to make sure that other operators take a stronger enforcement policy and they collaborate and we drive change throughout the industry. What we're also really keen to do, uh, as Nick covered, is, is uh, to develop genuinely higher welfare alternatives. Um, as you've heard, there are animals that are um, in captivity at the moment that can't be released to the wild. We're, we know that tourism can have a, a sustainable and long-term positive impact in helping those animals live high welfare lives. Um, those alternatives are few and far between at the moment and we're um, very keen to, to work with partners to develop those alternatives. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, David. There's time for three or four questions before the next session. who you are and then put your question. Yeah, yeah sure. Good afternoon, panel. Uh, my, my name's Clive Martin. I represent the World Station Alliance and uh, other um, conservation issues regarding cetaceans. Interested by the last speaker. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. David. David, very interesting to hear what you're saying as a large company. But in fact, you're not actually going far enough. For instance, as far as ABTA are concerned, who actually audits their protocols? Their protocols are actually very, very poor. And in the case, for instance, of Laurel Parquet, where recently Global Spirit gave them top marks, that's not any criticism against Global Spirit. It's the fact that the marks that they had to mark against are set at a very, very low bar. Uh, so my question to you is, Exactly what are you going to try to do to absolutely ensure that such institutions have the right welfare protocols? Which specialists are you going to use to tell you what those are? Thank you. Well, for um, first of all, um, yeah, I completely agree. It's not 
um, the, the guidance isn't far enough. Um, it's, it, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't guarantee uh, good care and husbandry to animals in tourism. Um, we're committed to working with ABTA in improving and toughening those standards. Um, we completely agree. Um, as well as our, our roasting program, um, we use our other internal and external partners, our own staff in destination, um, to spot check and make sure that um, what is identified in an audit actually takes place because we're aware that what auditors might see might not necessarily be the truth. We want to expand that program in the future to make sure that the conclusions we draw are legitimate and straightforward. And as I said, we're trying to audit against everything we offer by the end of next year and then look to what more we can do with our policy, what stronger decisions we can make to make sure that we offer our customers the best product available. Um, there's certainly, we don't, there is certainly a role for tourism uh, animals in tourism um, what we need to consider is higher welfare and more suitable alternatives for those uh, animals it, it, there's a transition for the industry I think that needs to take place that um, is only just beginning for us Tom do you want to comment on that Tom do you want to comment um, I can't comment on the specific um, case of, sort of standards around cetaceans um, I think any progress has to be iterative, and it's great to see sort of Thomas Cook moving forwards with these things. I think um, that at the moment there is no global regulation whatsoever of standards in anything, um, and just getting any sort of auditing in place is a massive step forwards. I think. There's a whole other side of things that can be addressed as well, which is in educating tourists and in giving them a platform and guidance as to how to assess the standards at individual attractions so that they become auditors of the places they've been and to try and get around some of those problems you get with people giving you know, four-star reviews for things they might not actually feel very comfortable about. And I think that... Um, I don't know if uh, Thomas Cook has a sort of review platform or whether that's going to... Have or well, that's something you might like to look into, but certainly, you know, we've had discussions on how to move forwards with getting tourists' feedback on all of these places, and then hopefully, then the people who are actually driving revenue to these places become auditors in their own right. That would be kind of a, a way forwards, I think, but it's a tricky thing to do. I don't think that's uh, addressed your question directly, but uh, I think it's just another another option. Thank, thanks very much, Tom. Is there another question? Hi, this is more of a, a little bit of a response to the previous um, comment and question. Yes. Um, so my name is Claire Jenkinson. I lead our sustainable tourism work at ABTA. So therefore, I uh, lead our work on animal welfare as well. Um, and I suppose I wanted to reflect on the balance that we've been trying to strike between creating change at scale with how far we can go and what, what we're trying to achieve. And I think when I've been at ABTA the last couple of years, but that the ABTA has been working with its members on animal welfare, I think since back until 2009, and the process of getting everyone to agree to a set of guidelines took years. And, and that process was about finding the balance, finding something that, you know, we've had widespread um, buy-in from across the industry. And so we needed to find that place where we could drive change and see improvements what, which we're now seeing, for example, with um, companies like Thomas Cook implementing it, but where we could also get the industry buy-in. Are those guidelines going to stay the same forever? Absolutely not. We need to carry on pushing the industry and getting views such as yourselves as, as we progress. Let me just let Nick... Nick, do you want to say something about the role of organisations like yours in relation to that? Yep. Yeah. Hello, my name is Audrey Melia. I'm the Deputy Director for Wildlife and World Animal Protection. And my question is directly to Claire. She knows it's coming. 
when are you going to revise the guidelines? Because you did say you would do it in 2018 and then you changed your mind. Okay, yes. I'm happy to answer. So yeah, the guidelines were launched in 2013. When they were launched, we said we would look at them again in five years, so that's next year. But what we found is that, I mean, as I think David's already alluded to, implementation was slow. And where we'd rather focus our efforts are um, getting that implementation, getting more and more and more tourism companies implementing those guidelines rather than changing something that's just going to sit on the shelf and it's a balance it's a trade-off um, but that's I strongly feel that's where we are but however absolutely I'm looking forward to the point where we can look look at that Nick it sounds to me as though your organization needs to get a bit more active with the public are you doing enough this is all I mean, as far as public engagement is, is concerned, uh, World Animal Protection has done um, you know, a big job on education and awareness um, over the last few years. We've had one million supporters sign up to date to the Wildlife and Entertainers campaign um, who've pledged to change their behaviour or who have taken action with us to voice their concern to industry, uh, which has driven change in, in certain companies. Um, you know, TripAdvisor is, is one example. Um, and you know, we're seeing that the impacts of that is, is, having, is having an impact on the industry, not just here in the outbound operators, but in places like Thailand where, you know, where the problems with the elephant camps or other tourist attractions um, stem from. We've got time for one more question. My name is Paula. I work with travel councillors. It's not so much a question, it's a comment. Tom, I think I can save you a heck of a lot of work. Talk to me afterwards. I was um, a wildlife volunteer in South Africa eight years ago. I've seen an awful lot of things in my despair. I've written a book about it, trying to raise awareness. I can put you in touch with a few people who will talk as long as you protect their identity. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in that environment that people aren't aware of. And if anybody wants to go and volunteer with wildlife, please do your homework. Thank you. There is a major um, debate going on in South Africa at the moment within SATSA about what the rules should be for wildlife animal interaction. And I think the issue will come up in WTM Africa and probably back here next year. Thanks very much for allowing me the microphone again. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, I know that uh, all of you are working uh, amongst friends. We all have um, the, the same intention to in ensure that these animals and the welfare of these animals is looked after. But I come back to the same point. We must be very careful of these guidelines. The guidelines are not enough. A dolphin in a concrete tank Painted blue two years ago has been audited and it's still in a concrete tank painted blue now. That is not good enough. So ABTA or anybody else that's involved in these guidelines, step up to the mark a little bit. We need this to be better. Thanks very much. Tom, do you want to, Tom, do you want to have the last word and maybe talk about where your research is going? Um, so I'm, I'm in the privileged position of being an academic, which means that uh, I leave the implementation to other people. But um, I think, from my point of view, um, I'm dealing a lot with um, tourists as consumers um, and how to create a green market whereby tourists are able to, off their own back, just look up, um, work out where the places to go to that would actually align with their fundamental values. So we know from my recent research, which isn't published, that 80% you know, of tourists absolutely want to be attending places that are good for animal welfare and good for species conservation. They absolutely want this. And we also know that if we prime them to just think a little bit about their choices, they are able to recognize the attractions that are likely to be good and those that are likely to be bad for animals. Um, 
what we can't do at the moment is access all of those people to prime them and it's too much to expect that somebody on holiday is going to turn themselves into an animal welfare specialist. So we need resources available so that if when we finally start engaging with people en masse and say, listen, it's your responsibility to sort it out if you're going on holiday. And this is the resource we have produced that will very quickly tell you which are which, which are the good places, which are the bad places. That, for me, I think would be a great step forward in conjunction with absolutely everything else we've been talking about. Thanks very much, Tom. It is worth reflecting on the fact that last year's session on um, animal welfare focused very heavily on the successful blackfish campaigns and the other ones. And it, I suspect that we're going to see more public campaigns of that kind going forward and the industry will then have to respond to it. I think part of the problem is waiting for the industry to realise that the public is actually gets very upset about these things. But I remember years ago when we started the Sustainable Tourism Initiative, way back in 2001, most of the letters tour operators got were about animal welfare. You know, it's an issue that's not going away. Anyway, we need to wrap up, I'm sorry, we need to wrap up at that point. Thank you very much. We have one last, oh, can we, sorry, it's very rude of me. Can we thank the panel in the, in the usual way?